cool. All right, so uh, section 11 basically is multiple linear regression. So we've done linear regression now, um, last time. And so linear regression, if you guys remember, basically you're just drawing, just drawing, you're drawing a line through your um, data points and trying to model based off that line. So multiple linear regression basically allows you to do um, that same concept of basically trying to model it with a quote unquote line. Um, but instead of doing it with just, you know, a, tar a feature in a target, our independent and our dependent variable, we still have our dependent variable, our target still, just one target, which makes sense. But we'll have multiple independent variables, multiple variables, multiple features. We'll usually call them as features and target. Okay. And so one thing to kind of note is I think I mentioned this last time. Um, uh, linear regression, just in general, multiple or simple, it's kind of like the first go-to of, what's it called, of um, like your arsenal as a data scientist, of your predictive modeling. That's kind of like, you know, like, hey, this is a, I know I can do this very quickly. Um, it's not super complicated and you can pretty get, you can get some pretty good results in this. Later in mod three, we'll actually go through a lot more um, different techniques with machine learning algorithms. And those are the ones I kind of say like, oh, those are like the really like cool, fancy, you know, like stuff, which again, they're really useful, but sometimes people kind of ignore linear regression because it's like, it, it feels not as cool. <laughs> like I think that's what people kind of say, but um, it is something that's super useful. So kind of keep that in mind of why we're talking about this stuff. All right, so let me go ahead and share my screen. And look, it wasn't that it wasn't that long that to take me to share, right? You guys can all see it, right? Uh, thumbs up if you can see it. Yep. So I can't see you guys. There you guys are. Okay, cool. So uh, multiple linear regression. I'm not going to go into full details of how to implement it, mostly because it's a lot of like, you know, you guys can. Um, I, I was thinking of asking you guys in the future is that like, uh, if you guys want me to go through like walk through the code and do that. Um, but there's a lot in the curriculum itself, and I think it makes more sense for you guys to try it out, play around with it, see what happens. Um, and so, but I'm going to talk about the different parts that you would need to create multiple uh, linear regressions, things that uh, come about that the fact that we're using multiple variables. Um, for example, we'll talk about collinearity, which basically is saying like, you know, are features related to each other and why is that bad or good or like, you know, why does it matter? Okay. So um, kind of going to this part, I don't have a collab notebook today, but I have to save to um, GitHub, and let me go ahead and share that to you guys, um, the specific resource. I'm trying to do more on the GitHub side because then you guys can mess around with it for yourself and do what you want. Oops, we're on mod two, we're on mod one. I note that I also put um, the other, like if I've been doing things with, um, with the other cohorts, I'll put it on there too. So that way, you know, you can also see like what's ahead if you really want to. Um, but note that you don't have to. I'm just kind of, that's where I'll put everything in there. So it's centralized. So um, I sent it through the Zoom chat, but um, I'll share it online too, or through Slack, just remind me if I forget. So anyway, um, yes, multiple linear regression. So main thing you have to really realize, it's pretty much the same thing, concept at least wise, as linear regression, but we're using multiple variables, okay? So, um, I kind of just diving right into this. This is actually uh, borrowed. A lot of this code right now is actually borrowed from Learn. Um, if we go through the curriculum and everything like that, so just be aware that that's kind of how things. Um, but uh, right here, basically, I'm. This is just I'm creating some random um, some random information. This is not this is not really important. Um, but just so you know, this np .random basically is coming from NumPy. Um, do you guys know what the seed is? Since we're looking at this right now, when we talk about np random .seed. Does anyone know what that is or have an idea? No, not really. Okay, cool. So kind of a fun fact about computers. Computers are not random. Computers are deterministic. Um, so the problem is to create random numbers. It actually is kind of difficult to do that, if that makes sense. Um, so a seed basically, the way computers generate random numbers or something called pseudo random numbers and pseudo meaning like fake random, they basically are really hard to reproduce. So they are essentially random because you can't, there's not a clear pattern that we can find. So that's kind of like why, sorry, my thing's freezing up here. Um, that's why we call it a uh, pseudo random. But the seed here, this number basically is like, oh, how are we going to start off ours? Uh, oh, that's fine, sorry. 
Okay. Um, we are starting off saying, oh, this is the number we're going to our seed before it starts basically making new random numbers. So if you give the same seed, you basically get the same results, even though it's quote unquote random. It's just, it looks random. It's not actually random. Okay. Um, but anyway, we're just making a different random uniform. Um, we're generating some data basically that ranges from 18 to 65. Those are the number of values. And then making a hundred of them. Um, is uniform meaning that 18, 19, 20, 30, you know, 30, those are all the same probability. So it's kind of like rolling a die. You know, you're just as likely to get a six as you are to get a one. Not all probabilities like that. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, income here is actually where they created a normal, um, a normal distribution. And to get those different, um, for a random normal distribution, um, not everything is equal value, right? Some values are very, very likely. They're in the middle of the, or closer to the center of our normal distribution. And some are very unlikely that are on the outskirts. So that's what's going on here with this income NP dot normal, okay? And then just doing a reshape to make sure that we actually have the right shape that we want, okay? So if we plot this out now, this is just kind of like, like, oh, we have some data. And we plot this out and just note that this is a line right here. This is like our linear regression, right? We have a bunch of data points. We have a scatter plot. You know, they're not all perfectly on that line because we basically did some random data, right? So if you have some noise in there, um, but we can draw something that's um, a regression line. And that's what that black line represents is something like a line of best fit. And we could an anal analyze that with basically R squared, you know, say how good of a fit it is. Uh, we can find line of best fit. Turns out um, we can do that with linear algebra. We'll see that in mod two. Um, it's like how that actually works. But for the most part, we don't do that by hand. We do that using a package like stats models, um, which we saw in section 10, okay? So this should hopefully feel like all review, right? So remember our line, um, our line of best fit, our regression line is basically our target, our Y is equal to some slope times the feature, right? Plus the intercept. So the idea is here, we, um, the slope is a constant, the intercept is some constant that we found. And all we do is we take a value, say, hey, you know, um, what are we measuring? Um, seniority. So we take the seniority, say, oh, this person's been um, around for 23 years. I wonder how much they should make. You plug it into this seniority, uh, that, into that feature, and out pops your prediction, your target, and you say, oh, they should make uh, 95,236. And then you might try to compare that with someone who's similar to 23 years or something like that. Um, and it won't be perfect. It likely won't be exact kind of deal because we can see this line of regression right here will not actually, um, will not have every single point put out. But just note that any point that you put in here, right, in this uh, model, it'll always be on this line. Okay, review. So if we want multiple variables, if we have multiple features, let's say seniority, um, it affects your monthly income, maybe things like, um, I don't know, let's say schooling, if you got a bachelor's versus um, associates versus just high schools versus a master's versus a PhD. How does that affect your income? Uh, you might have something like, uh, and I'm trying to think of some random stuff right now. Um, I don't know, throw out, throw out some ideas. What was some other things that might affect your income um, within the same company? Yeah, stuff in that sounds right. Location. <laughs> what was that? Location. Location, okay, so location might be like, okay, like maybe you're in like different states, different cities and stuff like that. Um, you can also have continuous variables. What was that? Well, if your package includes equity, usually. You have so equity and stuff like that, that's a good point. Say like, how much equity do you have? So that would account, you know, that might not account for your monthly income, but it's compensation, right? So that could affect how it goes through too. Cool. So you guys get the idea that there could be multiple variables. So we basically, basically with multiple linear regression, the fancy way of doing it is just say, all right, we're just going to add them all up. So we still have a Y intercept, which is that W zero here. And I'm using this W because um, this will later lead into like when we do machine learning, but note that you'll see in so many different ways because um, people write linear regression in so many different ways. But basically you have a constant here, W zero is some number, and then you'll have some number a coefficient times um, the first feature plus the second feature times some coefficient and then going all the way through for N number of variables. And so you notice that it's pretty similar to this part. Basically, we're just adding more and more features on each side. And that's really what multiple linear regression is. It's actually not that complicated when you think about it, if you understand what simple linear regression is, right? Okay. Now, quick question um, for those people who are maybe more familiar with the math. Does anyone know, like, if I have this right here with just one feature, so if I got rid of, if I looked at just this part of the equation and ignored everything else out, 
um, we would get a line, right? That's our line of best fit. Uh, does anyone know what shape we would get if we had this right here? Y equals W0, which is a number, plus some number times X1, plus some number times X2. Is it like a stair step kind of? It would like be a, a plane. Yeah, plane. Plane, that's right. And a plane meaning a flat, a flat like, you know, a piece of paper essentially, right? Um, and I think I actually have it right here. This is not the exact example, but you can think of it in three dimensions, you have a flat surface. And basically everything, if I look at just X1 and X2, um, you would put a number for X1, put a number for X2, and it would be somewhere on this plane, directly on it. Now your actual data points probably won't be on that exact plane. You can see that it probably is all over here or all over here. And this is where I think I might've said this a couple times is that data tends to be as you get, um, as you get into higher dimensions, so like more variables, your data tends to be, uh, data will be more sparse. So you can see there's a lot more space for the data to live off of the plane, right? Compared to over here, it's still infinite, but it's still like essentially more volume. And so as we begin to like, does anyone know what, so fun question, uh, what if we added a third one? So we had X1, X2, X3, does anyone know what that would be? If you a bell shape or um, like 3D? Yeah, it would be a 3D object, basically. And it, to be honest, it's not really easy to understand exactly what it is because it's in a 4D space. Basically, you have X1, X2, X3, and Y. That's your 4D. And unfortunately for us, we don't see in 4D. We, I don't know anyone who can visualize 4D. If you ever can, um, hats off to you because I don't think any, I, as humans, we just can't do that. And that's only 40. We usually have multiple features, sometimes even a hundred features. And so we have a hundred dimensions kind of deal. But basically all you have to know is like, essentially it's a hyper-dimensional plane. It's a flat surface. It's um, not gonna fit the perf data perfectly, but it'll have an idea of like, you'll get the idea, that's the prediction of it. Just like the regression line doesn't fit the data perfectly, but we have our prediction, okay? And that actually ends up being pretty decent, um, spelling enough. So anyway, basically your multiple linear regression is some form like this with n variables. Okay, pretty straightforward, at least the concept I think, right? It's like, oh, we have more variables, we have more terms. Um, one thing to note though, so uh, again, the curriculum actually talks about how to actually produce these linear regression lines, or I said hyperdimensional planes, right? But basically your predicted model, um, your y hat. Um, but one thing I did want to note real quickly is that there's a few aspects of um, this equation. So one thing is that this right here, our W1, our W2, those numbers, those are what we'll call our coefficients, right? Our mathematical terms. Basically, they're just numbers. And what those numbers really represent, does anyone have an idea if I said like, oh, like, oh for example, if this number, I'm just make something up. If this number was one versus a hundred and everything else was exactly the same except this number was bigger, does anyone have an idea what that might mean for X1? In relation to the target? It's the steepness of the line. Good. So that's right. So we talked about like, you know, if you have one um, two dimensional, right, we would have it as the steepness of the line. Um, so like we talked about the slope. And so as a more general thing, um, you can kind of think about it as like how much, like how much effect does X1 have? So like if X1 is really important about the target, for example, if we increase X by a little bit and the number W1 is very, very large, that means we increase X just a little bit, our target gets very large very, very quickly. So basically it's our way to kind of like adjust, you know, like you can think of it like how much it adjusts. If our W1 or our coefficient is very small, then that um, variable probably has very little effect on the target considering everything else is constant. And that's a really important thing that we'll talk about with multicollinearity is that we actually assume X1, X2, all the different features are independent of each other, but they don't affect each other. Now, is that true for most data? No, it seems a head shake's good, right? Most data is not actually independent, right? Most things are dependent on each other. For example, if you have more space in your house, you probably, not always, but you probably have more bedrooms you probably have more bathrooms if you have a bigger house kind of deal. So you can see there's some connection there. And that's actually where multicollinearity um, can be kind of issues. And we'll talk about that um, a little further down. But just know that's kind of what we assume when we're doing a multi, multiple linear regression. We're assuming 
all the other variables are constant. And if we just adjust one, and I think the curriculum and most people will say, if you adjust, you know, um, let's say X1 by a unit, by one unit, then you expect um, Y to go up by W1 units. So if it was like three times X1, if I adjust X1 by one unit, um, X, uh, Y hat will go up by three units. Um, cool. <laughs> yeah, I see you're done there. All right, cool. Um, so anyway, any questions on multiple linear regression on what that means? Okay, cool. And that's what you'll be using in your project. Your project will, you'll use a multiple linear regression. You'll have about 20-ish features um, to predict on. And just know that some will be related to each other. Some of them will have other issues. And that coefficient for your model basically tells you essentially how, um, how much that variable affects your target. What, okay. uh, what assumptions are made by doing mm -hmm. multiple linear regression? Yeah, so the first thing is, is the fact that uh, the variables that we're talking about, the features, they're independent. We kind of make that assumption. And that's not necessarily true for most data, but a lot of times it's true enough for us to get a decent model, if that makes sense. And that kind of makes sense. Like technically, for example, the weather is affected by, by my breathing, right? As I'm breathing in and out, I'm changing the temperature, I'm changing the moisture of the area. That does affect the weather overall. Realistically, it doesn't really affect it. My breathing is mostly independent of the weather itself, but in the technical sense it does. And that's kind of like why we can make these assumptions. Um, that's the main thing. Cool, good question. All right, cool. So I'll move on to this part. So. I kind of, we kind of seen continu our continuous variables where things can change over, um, what's it called? Over, um, like if I change, you know, X, you know, like I get 1.1, 1.2, 1 1.3, those kind of make sense. For example, ages, um, like number of days alive would be a continuous variable. Um, seniority, you know, you've been around for 14.3 years, you know, we have that. But we also have things like category. I think um, you guys said uh, like area, like location. Uh, location might be important and location is not really a continuous variable right you could technically put in longitude latitude but in a lot of ways that's, like, that's not exactly what we're talking about we're talking about like oh are you in a city or are you in the suburbs or are you in a rural area like that would be more category right and so category of that variables if you notice now you're like wait i can't really put that simply in here especially because sometimes category variables don't have a number right like if I said like, oh, if you're in the USA or if you're in you know, China, if you're in the UK, if you're in different um, countries, you know, there's not really a clear number that would be associated with that. And that's when you actually get into categorical value, uh, variables, okay? So I'm gonna go, go through an example. Um, this is actually from Learn2, to so just kind of know that um, that's where this comes from. Um, so if I run this now, uh, in this case, it's our um, automotives MPG. And the curriculum kind of talks about like, oh, we're basically trying to predict on how many miles per gallon based on all these features. So in this case, we have the features, number of cylinders, uh, displacement, and I actually don't remember what they said about displacement and what that is. And this is where domain knowledge is important, saying, well, what is this number supposed to mean? Um, but number of cylinders, number of displace, or the displacement, the horsepower, the weight, acceleration, model, uh, model year, origin, car name, okay? And again, this is where like, a, it's important to know the domain knowledge. For example, if you don't know what it meant by cylinders, like if you don't know anything about a car kind of deal, you might say like, I don't know what it means by cylinders. Does that mean like some cylinder part of the car? Why is that important? And something, oh, okay, like it's about a car. This is where domain knowledge is very important. But kind of ignoring that, we're kind of just looking at the data. And so that's what our data looks like. Um, we're gonna say our target is our MPG. That's what we're trying to predict, okay? And now we have to figure out um, sometimes some of these things are categories. So first things first, um, kind of looking at just our quick data and maybe you know things about cars. Which ones do you think would automatically you would think of as categories? Anyone got an idea? And just shout it out. Origin. Origin, okay, cool. Anyone else? Any ideas? Would model year? Okay, yeah, model year could be. Uh, category you think of that right but we talk about like a 2009 you know sedan and it's like oh well that's much more like a category than it is um mm -hmm. a time but you could also reason being like oh maybe model year should be more continuous variable even though it's only integer maybe it makes sense for it to uh change over time you know 
So these are one of those things that's kind of fuzzy being like, is it category or not? And sometimes to be honest, it's subjective. You have to say, does it make sense for me to treat this as a category? That's a good one, Adam. So cool. Um, anything else that we could maybe list as a category here? Cylinders. Cylinders, good. So cylinders would be one, for example, you know, uh, how many cylinders the car has, right? Um, this basically says what kind of engine it has. And that makes more sense than a variable. Um, and a lot of times too, I'm sorry, not a variable, a category. And a lot of times this category, we can kind of figure out some ways. It's relatively subjective, but there are ways we can kind of determine saying, well, this seems more like a category than it is a continuous variable. For example, cylinders, you wouldn't have a 32 cylinder car, right? Like you wouldn't have these weird numbers and stuff like that. You get like, oh, a four cylinder or eight cylinder or whatever, you know, you go through, there's only a certain number of values you can have. A uh, model year might be more towards actually being a continuous variable because you could have um, a huge range in the model year. Um, but depending on what your data looks like, maybe you really are looking at like, you know, from the 70s and it's like a 70, 71, 72, 73, maybe it makes more sense to make it as a category. So again, it all subjective in the sense of like, it's subjective, I'm saying like, you have to decide as a data scientist what makes sense for your data. What makes sense for your data. So you can do a continuous variable that, you know, like only goes up by like certain amounts. Cause obviously for a model year, there's not like a 70.1 or 70.2, you know, there's, so you can just do it. So it just goes up by an integer. Yeah. And that's the thing I think, like, what's interesting. And that was a good point, Eric, is that um, model year really doesn't change by, you know, Point, right? It's only 70, 71, 1970, 1972, you know, all that stuff, right? Um, so you have to kind of think about it too. And if your model is, if you're putting in things where it's like, oh, it's getting 70.5, just like in the sense like number of children, like let's say we're looking at number of children are born in the US, um, you know, we might say, oh, it's about 3.2, you know, per person, you know, per family per year or something like that, like just making up some number. Um, it doesn't mean that each person's having 3.2 kids, right? But in that case, it, it can be a continuous value because it's a large spectrum and we understand what those values are supposed to mean, even if we get like a point something. Um, but then again, if you have something like uh, we've talked about like cylinders, even though cylinders um, can vary in that sense, it might make sense to make a category. Uh, model year, I think is that perfect like in between where it could be go either or, and just know that you will have integers in that case. Okay, but good point. Uh, Sounds good. Cool. Yeah, that was a good point though, because integers can, even though it's integer numbers, I meaning it's only going up by like whole numbers, um, those can still be continuous variables. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of walk you through a little bit, and the curriculum goes uh, goes through a whole bunch more, but I'm kind of walk you through like holistically, like what this would look like. So it's like okay, like we're, we have our data, it's like let's go find out what a categorical var variable is. So the, one of the biggest things you can do is going through exploration. So if you remember back in our data, life si uh, data science life cycle, if you remember that um, we had basically going through like uh, collecting the data, mining the data, cleaning data, and then going into exploring data, usually that cleaning and exploring data is kind of back and forth. You'll do a little bit of ex exploration and then go back to cleaning and you're gonna mm -hmm. do, some, do some exploration. So now that's kind of like what we're doing here. It's like, we're actually looking to clean our data, but we'll have to do some exploration at the same time, okay? So first thing I'll do is a data.info just to see what's here. And one thing you can kind of quickly say, um, you guys didn't mention this, but car name. Car name would probably be category, right? Because it doesn't make sense to have anything else in that sense. So usually things that are like, you know, we say objects being strings um, are likely categories. Not all the time. Sometimes they're just misinputted. For example, if there is a string in that column, like so for example, let's say someone put like, um, um, put one, two, three, four, or five, you know, something like that, but then they spell out number one or something like that, it would automatically count that whole column as a string or an object. And so you have to make sure, this is part of the cleaning part, you'd have to make sure that that part is actually counted as a number if that's what you need, if that's what you intended it to be, okay? Um, but you can see like quickly, it's like, hey, we have some floats, some integers. Um, usually, I mean, not all the time, but usually, when we have an um, integer, it's like, okay, that might mean something, it might be category. Even floats though, um, even though it is a float, maybe it's like, for example, it got read in this 1970.0, or it's had cylinders and had 8.0 for some reason. Maybe something happened 
where there's a category. Or you might have something where the category makes sense. Um, for example, you might have like, I'm trying to think for an example of this, bedrooms like, or bathrooms, like one and a half baths, you know, like that might be more of a category than it is a continuous variable, but we'll put 1.5. So all, it's all context, right? But this can give you a very quick like ideas like, okay, what looks like might be a category. And so it's like, okay, well, it looks like car name is probably a category. We can kind of guess that here. And then we can also do a dot describe. And dot describe also helps us, allow us to see the range of variables. So for example, if you didn't know what cylinders are, you might say, wait a second, right here on cylinders, I'm seeing our count, our mean, but you see like the minimum and the maximum, and it only goes from three to eight. And it looks like they're all integers. It's like, hmm, that seems a little kind of suspicious in that sense. And we saw that there were integers here. Like, okay, maybe this makes more sense to the category. So we have to explore that a little bit more. Um, origins of really suspect in the sense that there's 392 values, but we have either one, two, and it looks like three. And it's kind of like, okay, that probably makes more sense as a category by itself, just by looking at the numbers. So you can see both things from like domain knowledge and from the fact that like what the data looks like. And so another way we can do this now is we can actually plot it out. And so if I plot this out, and this is from the curriculum, um, I won't go through the whole thing, but this is basically creating multiple scatter plots. Okay. And there's multiple ways that you could have done this, um, but this is the way at least uh, the curriculum goes through. And you can see we have cylinders, model year, and origin. This is basically what the curriculum said. Oh, I think cylinders, model year, and origin might be categorical values. Um, so they actually list this out. And you can actually see um, a good way to kind of say, oh, what makes sense as like a category is if you see a lot of these lines going through. If you have instead seen, let me just put something like weight, you'll see their scatter plot. It's a lot more varied and stuff like that. Um, there's, you know, there's, there seems a little bit of variable. It seems more of a continuous value. Um, our model year here seems to be categorized, you know, which makes sense, 1970, 1971. Right, um, we have more of a category value. Note, however, though, you might have like many, many years. You, if you have like a hundred years for categories, um, it might make sense to treat that as a continuous variable, but it all depends on your context. And here, it might make more sense for us to actually make a category since there's only 70 to 82. Okay, or yeah, 82. Cool. So, um, any questions on this guy on like how we're using this plot to determine if it's category? All right, cool. Yeah, and again, you're mostly seeing if the values are basically just all within segments like this. Basically, they're just, they're categorized. You can kind of think of like they're making one little grouping, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, another way you could have done this is through pair plots. And so if I run this now, um, you'll see something similar, but no, this is a lot bigger. My computer's burned slow today, I don't know why. But um, you can do a pair plot and you can do multiple graphs in this way. But note that this one right here, um, they plotted MPG by cylinders, MPG by model year. This one is plotting all of them. Like for example, cylinders by MPG, cylinders by displacement, you know, cylinders by horsepower. So this might be harder to read, um, but just know there's another way to this. This is probably, to be honest, a cleaner way of looking at specific ones. And if you wanna make a visualization, you probably would wanna do it this way. But if you're looking at the data really quickly and you're okay looking at this amount of data, um, this could be a quick way for you to check out specific parts. Um, also know you could have like restricted the data to just look at just um, cylinders or just model year with this plot too. Um, it's just kind of showing you just a couple options, right? And then um, another thing we can do, I showed you kind of doing scatter plots. Another thing we can do is actually use uh, histograms. And so this is, um, I'll show you like what you guys are used to. So you guys are probably used to seeing the data.hist like this and you can do multiple histograms, but you notice that's kind of hard to read a little bit. Like you can read it, but it's a little difficult. Um, note that I put this little semicolon here. The reason why I do that is because when I run this on, um, on uh, what's it, on a Jupyter Notebook, and I, this is the last part, it's basically doing a display, and it'll also display this chunk. I don't really want that. So if I put a semicolon, or if I just did, I think I could just do print, oh, that probably has to be display. No, okay, yeah. This allows me to basically don't show this extra matplotlib. It's restricting what I'm seeing, so that way I don't have to have that mess. But you can see it's kind of messy. It's kind of hard to read. So what we could do, and this is actually from the curriculum, um, they made it a figure and then they added with that figure, you're getting the axes of that figure. So you can think of like, what I'm about to make is um, a figure with the axes and then we're gonna put the histogram within those axes. So it's kind of a little advanced move, but it makes it look prettier. 
So you can see it's a lot easier to see this way. And you can see what we can have now is a histogram, kind of the same idea. We can see that they're grouped like, oh, cylinders seem to be like in these kind of strict columns. Um, same thing with origin. Note that model year isn't as, it's in the sense clear that they're in their own categories kind of deal. And so this is where, you know, it kind of blurs the line and being like, well, maybe this is considered more of a continuous variable. Um, this would be especially true if your model year, if you plan to predict on like model years that are older, like six, the 1960s or things that are newer, like the 1990s, like maybe that's your, um, what you want to eventually predict on. It might make more sense than sense doing that as a continuous variable over a category. But if there's only gonna be uh, three cylinders, four cylinders, five cylinders, six cylinders, or eight cylinders, um, then it might make sense to say, let's just go ahead and keep that as a category because those are the only values that will come up. Okay, cool. Any questions on how we kind of identified these categories between histogram here or looking at just the info in general? Uh, what's the dot GCA open parentheses, close parentheses? Yeah, so this is actually getting, uh, good question, Adam. Uh, this right here, um, and I would say probably look this up more because there's a lot of information you can get. Um, this is basically just getting the axes. So that's what we're saying with this AX is basically the axes of the uh, figure. I honestly don't know what GCA stands for. Um, I wonder if we can do it here. So GCA, get the current axes, creating one if necessary. I don't know what G why GCA, but it's getting basically the ca uh, the axes of the the figure. So we created a figure here. Get and then current axes. What's that? Maybe it stands for get current axes. Oh, that makes sense. That's probably it. Get the current axes. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> There's always a reason for it, but no one ever knows why. Um, for the record, like you guys know, like Git and GitHub, um, it's G-I-T, right? Supposedly, people ask like, why is it spelled Git? And the creator says, oh, because you know it's like getting get, but um, I didn't want to use G-E-T because you know that'd be confusing. And a lot of people say, I think it's a typo. I think they just spelled it wrong. Um, so who knows? Sometimes um, just to be aware of, and you'll see these kind of things happen all the time um, in programming. So yeah. Anyway, good question. So, and that was just to make it pretty. So once we identify it is a categorical value, then we can do something called transformations. So this is basically a way for us to use interlinear regression because now we identify what our categories. We don't want to just get rid of them, right? We actually want to use it. It's useful information. I want to know if the, you know what the origin is. I want to know how many cylinders it is. That could affect you know the miles per gallon, but there's not a clear way of doing that with continuous variables. So we can actually do transformations and this basically two main ways that we can do a transformation other than just like getting rid of our column, which is probably not a good idea because it is our data. We want to keep that um, and use it. So one is called label encoding. And so this goes through the curriculum too. Um, and basically, I keep suggesting this, I don't know why, but um, when we do a label encoding, basically what we're trying to do is saying, okay, let's break it into different categories. And we can break that into basically, um, we'll start with zero of what each category is. So we'll start with cylinders. And you can see if I look at just the data and what its D type is, basically within that series, within that column, what the type is in that data, we'll see it's an integer, okay? And so what we can do now, we can actually convert it as a category type. And this actually is really useful for pandas now. So now we can con convert this guy. And note that um, most of the time when we use these um, functions, usually they call them, they're out of place, meaning that like they'll make a copy and then return you a copy of the thing that you changed. As type will actually change the current thing. So know that you can't easily go back. You'll have to um, be aware of what you're doing. So this is really important when we do the project. Um, as you kind of go through things like from the top down and you do as type um, and you might do it multiple times or delete it or, you know, like move back and forth. Um, that as type changes it in place. So if you get rid of it, it's still changed. So for example, if I run this now, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. See, now our, our um, data cylinders, our D type is now category. And I can actually have this part right here. Um, let's talk probably a bad example. But if, even if I didn't put this part in here, if I kept this out, this will change it in place. And it'll actually do um, D type right here. So just be kind of aware. So anyway, I changed it to a category and this is a few things. So one is I can actually look at the different unique values, eight, four, six, three, um, six, three, five. Okay. Those are different categories and note that it labeled it within basically a different order than three, four, five, uh, 
six and eight. It did it in a slightly different order. In fact, it went in, if you kind of notice it, it went in this order over here. So just kind of be aware that it can change in different order. But basically now we have our categories and you can see what our unique ones are. And now we can actually look at, um, not the categories, but actually the codes. So this will actually be in basically zero, one, two, three, four. So note that before, and I look back on our head, this is the very first data point right here. How many cylinders we had? We had eight cylinders, right? But now we have a category, it being four, and that doesn't mean four cylinders, it just means the fourth category. So you can think of zero, one, two, three, four. Okay, so basically saying oh, what those different categories are now. So I do a dot unique on this, we can actually see that it's actually um, eight stands with four, four goes with one, three, six goes to three, three goes to zero, five goes to two, which seems like, like that seems a lot more confusing now, but this could be really useful. We have multiple ones, or if, let's say, for example, you had something like a 4.5 cylinders or, you know, like, like I said, like two and a half bathrooms. Um, now you have an integer number to correspond with it. Okay. You also could have done it this way, um, which is basically using sklearn. sklearn is used a lot for a lot of machine learning stuff. Um, so this is really useful to like go through. So it's just an alternative way to doing it. And just know that they just changed the, basically the categories on here. So just know that um, there's an alternative way for you to change it. Okay, cool. All right, so that's your first way, label encoding. Um, another way, which to be honest, this is how I tend to do a lot of stuff is called dummy variables. And so we have our origin here, which is another category type. We can see there's one, three, and two. Those are our different origins. We can do get dummy variables. Okay, and we do a get dummy, we basically convert it so that now everything is in its own column. Basically, if it has the origin of one, if it has origin of two, if it has origin of three, and basically this one and zero means yes or no. Yeah. One meaning yes, zero meaning no. So that's kind of like what's being interpreted here is that now each category, instead of being like its own separate thing, or sorry, its own thing in a column, you now make every specific category into its own column. And this is kind of useful now because now you can so say, oh, basically your, when you test me a model, you basically say, is it um, an origin of one? And you say, yes, you know, and basically your line will be adjusted up or down depending on, you know, if it is from origin one. Um, if it's origin two, you know, it does the same thing, zero or one going up or down. Uh, so you're kind of adjusting it up and down. It's like a switch, a binary switch. So I think this makes actually in the long term more sense than what tends to be for label encoding, but they're both valid options. And then um, just know there's an alternative way right here from sklearn. Note that it's a little more complicated. Okay, so we can see this right here. And this is really called hot encoding. Basically, you're, you're encoding each category into um, its own separate category. Um, so one hot, one hot encoding, that's what it's called. Note that in the future, for linear regression, it doesn't really matter which two you use, but for um, certain machine learning algorithms, you have to have one hot encode. Um, the algorithm will not work if you don't do that. And that'll be something we'll talk about more in mod three, but just be aware that this is more common and what you'll probably have to use in the future. Okay, cool. Um, any questions on what we did on this guy? So the dummy variable um, is integer or it's... Um... It's, in it's an integer. So um, it's technically more of a Boolean, but the reason why we call it more like an integer is because now when we have our function, we have like y equals w0 plus, you know, let's say um, w1 and then times x1. And let's say x1 is this column right here. What will happen is basically there's a w1, let's say this is like three. So if x1 is one, we just say times one. If x1 is zero, it's times zero it has no effect. So that has the effect of basically bumping it up by three or just keeping it the same. So it is in fact um, an integer, but you can think of it like a binary. And another question, a little uh, unrelated, um, when we have multiple uh, variables, do we also check the normality? Or it's like, if it's categorized, we don't care and we only um, care about the continuous variable? Yeah, no, that's actually a good point. So you do want to check normality because there's a few things you can do with that. Um, for linear regression, it's actually not required for us to have it normal. There's not like a, 
actual assumption that we've taken place, say, oh, this has to be normal. Um, we mostly want it to be normal so we can do other hypothesis testing. Um, and to be frank is that on the mod one project, we're not looking to do hypothesis testing. You're basically looking for modeling to see if you can um, develop a model, basically a linear regression. Um, but in other cases, you would care about if it's normal or not, because you want to see, like, well, can I compare this with each other, with other data sets or within basically populations? So in that case, you would care. Cool. Good question. All right. So good. So um, again, the, the curriculum goes through a lot more detail of like how this goes through, like walkthrough. But basically, the code is exactly what I showed you. There's not really that much to it. Um, it's mostly identifying what is a category, if it makes sense to be a category, and then proceeding most likely with dummy variables. But you can do that other thing. Um, note that when you're actually doing something like a project, you probably want to save the one hot encoding, like the dummy variables for the end of your cleaning session in your visualization, only because if you try to visualize, let's say you have like, like let's say uh, model years, you end up going category and there's like 30 model years, or now you have 30 new variables, right? 30 new features that are either zero and one. It's just hard to visualize those things. So it's easier to do the visualization first and say, oh, these ones need to be hot encoded and then hot encode those parts at the end. Um, so you can actually visualize it first. Something to kind of keep in mind. Cool. All right, so this leads us into multicollinearity. So um, I'm kind of just going through this kind of briefly of like what's multicollinearity is. And I think it's one of those things right now when we talk about um, doing, it feels very, uh, it feels very ad hoc. It feels very like, like, oh, like, isn't there a better way to do this? And honestly, um, there will be. Um, to kind of put you guys out there. We won't really talk about it until mod two, um, but it's something that you should be aware of that what will affect. So multicollinearity basically, it's like if they're basically correlated, if there are multiple features correlated with each other. And this is actually can be really bad. Does anyone have an idea why this might be bad? Um, just any random idea? It's subtle. It could be. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, um, is it because like an independent variable can affect two dependent variables the same way so that the two dependent variables, even though they both increase, they're not really dependent on each other? Right, I think I get what you're saying. Maybe the term's a little mixed up. Um, you might have two independent variables and if you increase one, you can then increase the other one, which then increases the other one, which then also increases the dependent. And then you start having this issue saying, wait, which is the thing that's actually causing that effect? Right. And so okay. it's basically what you end up doing, you end up double counting. Basically, you double count the effect on there. And you can actually have too large of a reliance on these two independent, these, in these quote unquote independent variables, but in fact, they're dependent on each other. And so those are things that's like, oh, if we see that kind of stuff as a very strong correlation with each other, we might want to consider um, using one of those, or we use other techniques. For example, um, we'll use techniques to basically um, essentially create a new feature and we'll create a new feature out of those two um, parts. Now, this is a little more advanced in that sense that we'll talk more in mod two and then even into mod three, um, but just know that kind of exists and stuff like that. And so, like I said, um, the big thing is that large changes in our, basically in our model. So like if we have these two quote unquote independent variables, these features that are actually very correlated with each other, these small changes in the model, like our small changes with those features will make huge changes in the overall model. Um, and basically we're double counting, that's what's going on. And this can actually just to uh, p-values are inaccurate, which means your p-value looks significant, like a p-value like less than 0 0.05, but it turns out it's like, oh no, that is not actually accurate. Um, it turns out that it should be a much lower or much higher p-value, meaning not as significant, but because you're double counting this effect, you end up getting a smaller value than what it should be. So something, basically these are things to kind of be aware of. And we'll talk more in the future about how we're gonna actually deal with multicollinearity. Uh, linearity, yeah, multicollinearity. So basically when things are um, associated with each other. Cool. All right, so I just wanna show you guys, for example, how you would look at this. So again, this comes from the curriculum, same data. Uh, you can see the same data, it's right here. Okay, and we can do what we call a scatter matrix, which is super useful. Um, so I'll show you what that looks like. And, oh, we're running close on time, but that's okay. So I kind of show you a little bit about pair plotting. It's very similar, but basically you can see right here, this plots 
every value. In this case, I think I'm only using the features, so I'm not including MPG, because that's our thing that we're trying to do our target on. So just looking at just the cylinders and all that. And car names are not really important, but you'll notice the car name doesn't show up on here, so I didn't really bother dropping it. Um, but uh, horsepower, basically this graph right here is horse, or I should say displacement by horsepower. And this creates a graph right here. You can see weight by displacement, acceleration by displacement. So you can very quickly, remember how I said um, people are very good at finding patterns? That's kind of what we're doing, is that we can kind of see very quickly, like, hey, what things look you know, correlated? And you can see right here, for example, acceleration and weight doesn't seem to be very correlated with each other. Um, you might see, for example, displacement and horsepower actually be very strongly correlated. Okay. And then we might say, oh, maybe we have some, maybe we have some co uh, correlation right here, maybe some negative correlation on this one. So you can kind of very quickly like see some patterns. And what's nice about this graph too, um, in the middle, our displacement by displacement would have a perfect correlation, right? A positive correlation. If displacement goes up, displacement yeah. goes up, right? So instead what happens is basically it creates a little histogram of the distribution of the values. So it's kind of a nice, very quick way to look at the data. Um, through this way or the pair plots was one I showed earlier too. Okay. So just know that this exists and this is how we can quickly look and see if there's patterns that we need to investigate. Um, but of course, it doesn't give us very good numbers, right? And we can actually calculate those correlation values. So we actually have this little guy right here and this, this dot core performs on top of the data frame and basically will create a correlation, actually calculate correlation for each of those parts. So you can think of like this right here is this matrix, but with the numbers. So for example, horsepower and displacement, those are positively correlated by a 0.89, which is a very high correlation right here, versus something like, let's say, uh, right here, acceleration and displacement. Acceleration, displacement, there's some correlation, but it's not super strong. Well, does someone have a question? No? Okay, cool. So then this gives us some numbers, but sometimes it's like, if you have a lot of features, it might be hard to like read all of this stuff. So we can do like a heat map, right? We can basically make a visual out of this. And so this is using Seaborn's heat map, and we're using that correlation. And the center is basically just like allowing us to say what is a zero, since zero correlation is what we care about. Um, let me ask you guys, is negative correlation, like if I had a negative 0.8 and a positive 0.8, are those correlations, um, which one's worse? Or I said, which one's more correlated? They're both evenly correlated? Yeah, they're yeah. equally correlated, just in reverse. Yeah. Yeah, trick question, right? They're both as much correlated. So that's why we're setting it at zero, saying, oh, zeros would not correlated. But then as we get away from zero, that means it's more correlated. So if I run this now, you can see a heat map. For example, the very bright yellow, almost orangey ones are um, very correlated. And then the ones that are very blue, very dark, or not dark blue, very bright blue right here, those are correlated in the negative way. And you would expect it to be um, symmetric because it's basically just fl flipping them over. So if one's positive and you flip it over, it could be negative on the other direction, okay? So this makes it up very quickly for you to check out and say, oh, are, how things are really correlated. And you can see most of these are not on this side. Yeah. And then the curriculum talks more about feature scaling, cross-validation, which I think we'll talk about next time, at least briefly. Um, but um, there's just a lot to go through. This is a very meaty section. Um, any questions about correlation or anything else like went through here. I know I'm kind of running over time. Um, so from the heat map, <clears throat> it seems um, most of the um, variables are correlated, except origin, acceleration, low year, right? Yeah. And so this is something that you kind of have to like decide, like, we're kind of doing very like, like hand wavy kind of saying there's multicollinearity and you have to worry about it. But then it's like, when do we care about it being super correlated with each other? And this is where um, we haven't really talked about the formalism of what you do. Um, the curriculum kind of like says like, oh, look, you can see their multicollinearity. At this stage right now, it's probably better to just say, note that multicollinearity exists. And maybe if things are very correlated, for example, weight and displacement, um, like I would say probably like above 0.85 that's when you kind of have to say, oh, you know, this is something that we might want to drop and only consider one of those aspects. Um, but there'll be more advanced techniques that we can actually use to figure out how to do this properly. Because otherwise you're just dropping a lot of data and it's kind of, like I said, it's kind of hand wavy. It's like, oh, well, and this is kind of correlated, so I'm gonna drop it. Again, it's not the best example. Uh, we'll talk about more advanced things like PCA, um, but just kind of be aware that that can affect your model. 
a question. All right, anything else you guys want to ask? Um, any questions about so this? So in our project, we are not expected to deal with, um, even though it exists, we don't need to worry about it. Yeah, I would say, since I'm the one doing an assessment, what I would say is know that it exists. Like I would do, the, I would still do these plots and see if there are things that are very highly correlated together. Um, you could drop them from your model and see if it changes, for example, like your prediction factor um, and your p-values. But the main thing is knowing which things are likely correlated together. Um, and you could on, honestly, making a model is relatively quick once you know how to do it. Um, you could make multiple models and see, hey, this model does really well with when we drop out of our correlation, uh, our p-value is significant in that way. Um, it was, oh, we dropped this part out, doesn't really change much. Again, that's very hand wavy. That's not, in a sense, what professionally you would probably do. You'd use more advanced techniques, but we haven't talked about that yet. Okay, cool. All right, guys. Um, so any other questions? Um, otherwise, I'll head off or stop this now. Okay, stop recording. <laughs>